Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the second day of our HPSN UK conference. Welcome back those who were attending yesterday and welcome those who are joining us today. So yesterday we had very exciting sessions, uh, very good presenters. The, the feedback was, was very positive. Uh, the round tables, the different sessions went very well. You were good sports, you know, you remember yesterday morning, Rob was going one, one, two, two, so we separated everyone into uh, different groups and you went through rotations and that format actually served uh, very well the purpose of our people interacting with as many of you as possible. And you were good sports. I didn't see any attrition, so everybody took part in all the groups and the activities, so that, that was great. <laughs> So, uh, and that's the whole idea, right? Um, HPSN is all about people in education. So we want to interact with you and we want to interface with you and get your feedback on the ideas that we have and the new technologies that we're bringing to market. So I think it was a, a very successful day. Yesterday was more about the technology and the innovation. Today is more about the, th um, the, uh, the trends in educational strategy. So a little bit of a different twist, but something that's very important for us. And once again, I think we're going to have very lively and engaging discussions today, just like we had yesterday. So uh, with that, I I'd like to show you a few highlights of, uh, of yesterday's sessions. Uh, I think we started on the right foot with a very uh, passionate uh, advocate of, uh, of technologist or simul uh, simulation operation specialist. So Tim did a great job. Uh, he was our first keynote speaker yesterday and certainly set the, the tone for the conference. Um, and the comments also on the following keynote, uh, Jean Nicklin's presentation, presentation were unanimously uh, positive a and I think it kind of kick-started an interesting discussion right and in fact you know at the reception uh, yesterday I was having a number of discussions of people who said well I'm a kind of a jack-of-all-trades you know in different in different countries uh, there is formal or not really formal uh, name and and nomenclature for for this position so uh, so I think it kind of uh, help start a discussion on, on better defining the role of the uh, uh, simulation operation uh, uh, specialist. So it was very interesting. And then uh, the mobile simulation unit was a hit. Everybody wanted to uh, tour it. Of course, it was kind of limited because of the space. You'll have a chance to visit the simulation unit today if you couldn't yesterday. Yesterday, you know, to try to accommodate everyone, we kind of extended the hours. Uh, so even during the reception, people could, uh, could tour and visit the mobile simulation unit. So that was certainly a, a hit. And once again, I think the idea of the rotation served well the, our purpose yesterday. Uh, another interesting session, I heard a lot of great things about the moulage sessions. You know, some of you got bloody creative. Um, so we have an example here. So I think it was all fun, but at the same time, it was a, an interesting uh, learning experience. Uh, in terms of technologies, because that was the theme yesterday, uh, I think that the augmented reality and the holograms made quite an impression. We received a lot of feedback, and it kind of kick-started the discussion about, you know, the the place that should have screen-based simulation, augmented reality, virtual reality. So everybody knows that it's, it's going to be more and more prevalent as time goes by, uh, but it was interesting to have your take on that. Once again, uh, we don't want to come to market with technologies that are just a wow, right? That we're not about special effects. We really want something that's going to serve uh, an educational purpose, and that's going to add educational value to what we do. And then another technology that was well received was Juno. As you know, I said it yesterday. Um, it was yesterday when we unveiled Juno. It was the first time it was shown to the public. For, you know, for us, it's three years of work you know, that at one point involved pretty much all the segments of the company. So we've been very engaged in that, in that journey of bringing Juno to market and bringing a better uh, clinical skills mannequin to market. So it's been a lot of work. Uh, so of course, you know, it culminated yesterday when we presented that to you and already we have uh, very positive feedback. So I, I thank you for that. And in, in a few hours from now, I'm going to be flying to Washington DC to see our North American debut of, uh, of Juno, but you can certainly claim that you were the first one in the world to see it. Uh, we had an unexpected mystery guest at the reception. Uh, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so it was announced. Um, it, was, it was still a question mark on the identity of, the, um, of this character, so now we know. Uh, and uh, I, I'm, I'm ha happy to report that there was no victim of the uh, special guest and uh, none of the simulators uh, got an arrow uh, except the photographer so this was his last picture um, he was transferred to the local hospital and he remains in stable condition so uh, 
So that was fun. And then I, I didn't have this comment firsthand. S someone told me that he had heard that. Um, and I wanted to put it out there because uh, I think it's very positive and I think it's a tribute to the work of the whole team, right? To pull two days of exciting sessions, it takes to the whole team at CA Healthcare months and months of work. Uh, so I was very excited to hear something like that. I think it's a tribute to their work and I want to give them a, a big hand. So please join me. And for this to be a success, you know, it goes both ways. You also, we also need to have an, an audience that participates, that, that is enthusiastic, and that has a lot of energy, and that's exactly what, what you've been uh, uh, day one, so, so th that's very exciting. So uh, I really look forward to a very engaging day two of our sessions. So I'm very pleased with, with that. Now, uh, today we're going to talk more, that's the focus, about simulation and educational strategies. So as you know, our world of simulation in healthcare is changing very fast. Thanks to innovations, you know, that are kind of changing the ways we're doing things, but also thanks to new theories or new approaches to education. So while simulation at one point was confined to the walls of a sim center, right, and a simulation would happen in a simulation center is not doesn't hold true anymore, right? Simulation can happen in the field, it can happen in a vehicle, in an ambulance, it can be done in situ, and always serving a different purpose and always with benefits. And as this thing is a kind of a moving target and as the educational strategies are changing, well, there's a lot of people that need to adapt to that. And the educators want to try more things, the, the operational, uh, the operation specialist need to adapt to that. And I see lots of miracles as we're pushing the envelope. I see lots of simulation centers creating very realistic environments that are very conducive to better learning and, and better patient safety ultimately do pull miracles on a shoestring, and I see that you know around the world. And that's a tribute to our uh, very entrepreneurial, very passionate approach to simulation. Uh, people who really believe in it uh, and are going to push the envelope. So I think it's, this is a, a very relevant uh, topic today to talk about you know, these different strategies, their benefits, and how to optimize them. So uh, I'm, I'm delighted to say that today we have 18 sessions, concurrent sessions, so it's impossible to attend all of them. But you know, you have, I think, a, a, a wide range to choose from and very in interesting uh, speakers, um, uh, very noteworthy. Our very first customer in the United Kingdom, uh, you know, pioneering institution, uh, the University of Bristol is going to have a session. They're going to talk about uh, um, uh, model-based physiology today. So something that's really dear to our heart, you know that we've been working a lot on, uh, on physiology that we integrate into our screen-based simulation and also into our patient simulator. So that, that's a very promising session. I uh, also want to recognize representatives from the Sibadem <laughs> University from Istanbul in Turkey. I mentioned them uh, yesterday. They're going to have a session. Uh, interestingly enough, they're a newer customer, uh, but they're a center of excellence. So it's a C Healthcare centers of ex Center of Excellence. They have an outstanding facility. They're going to talk about uh, their research on the effectiveness of simulation with nursing students, so another interesting session. I'd like to recognize also Matthew Aldridge. Uh, Aldridge, sorry, is is uh, from the European chapter of Enaxel. Enaxel is the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning. So we have a relationship with them. I'm going to allude to the partnership that we have with them. And in fact, if I'm flying to Washington DC in a few hours from now, it's to attend their annual meeting. That's where we're going to launch Juno for its North American debut. So uh, that's going to be interesting. He's going to talk about the implementation of the new uh, international nursing, uh, sorry, of the new uh, international standards for best practice that was uh, published by Enaxel. So that's going to be an interesting session as well. And I'm delighted also to welcome Andy Anderson. I don't know if he's here. Uh, I don't see him. Anyways, he's going to have a session. Wish him happy birthday. It was his birthday yesterday. I wanted to uh, <laughs> say that while he was here uh, in front of everyone. I missed that. But uh, he's the CEO of ASPI. That's the Association for Simulation Practice in Healthcare. So he's going to have a, a session today. And uh, wish him a happy birthday for me when you see him. So that's going to be an interesting session as well. And we've been partnering with ASPI as well. And, and Andy is a great person to work with. Now, just you know, quickly, our stance on, on education. Obviously, we're not just providing technology. We want to support education. We want simulation to be a sustainable initiative, a sustainable endeavor. And to do that, 
we need to partner with scientific societies. We need to partner with key opinion leaders like all of you. So for us, it's important. And that's also the, the whole idea of creating these forums that are HPSN, to have this conversation and that interface with specialists and experts and scientific societies. So this is just a, you know, a, a, a quick uh, uh, overview of some of the societies that we've been working with over time and which, which we have a relationship. Th there's more uh, of these societies for us. It's very important. Uh, we're not writing the guidelines. Uh, we don't accredit physicians. We don't certify anything. We're just there to provide a technology and an approach and services that support a more sustainable simulation-based education and something that's going to have an impact. That's something that's going to improve patient care and patient safety. So to do that, to properly do that, and it's not mandatory for us, uh, it's just the right thing to do, it's to partner with experts and scientific societies. I alluded yesterday to our anesthesia simstat, so this is something that uh, we created with the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and I'm happy to, uh, to report that now it's approved for maintenance of certification of anesthesiologists. In other words, they're going to gain credits as they go through the different modules. So which means that we had to create something with ASA that would comply with the very stringent and strict rules of maintenance of certification of the American Board of Anesthesiology. And we're happy to uh, have complied to that and we're recognized for credit. So we're very proud of that. And once again, we absolutely want to do that. We want to comply with these, uh, with these strict uh, criteria because we want to make sure that the standards are maintained and that's the role of the boards and the Royal College. So very happy to be, uh, to be part of that adventure, of, uh, that initiative. I just wanted to allude to an axle. I mentioned that Matthew Aldridge is with us uh, today. Uh, we created a joint fellowship with an axle. So once again, an axle is the International Nursing Association for Clinical Simulation and Learning. So it, it's international, it's, it's all about nursing and simulation, and they publish the standards of best practice. And what we wanted to do with them is to spread these standards, just once again, to make sure that we sustain this, uh, uh, this simulation approach, simulation-based education, that it becomes an endeavor that really bears its fruit. And to do that, we wanted to um, provide a forum where we can spread these uh, best, uh, best practices guidelines, the, these standards. So in, in doing that, and it's open to everyone, it's not only for our customers, it's really to make sure that this field grows and fulfills its promises of improving patient safety. So we're, we're very, very, um, very, very <coughs> involved in that. And initially, we had only a few cohorts in the US, and that's been expanding very rapidly, thanks to popular demand. And we, ho we held sessions in the UK, sessions in the Middle East, more sessions in the US, and this is expanding internationally. So we're very happy about that. Um, if you're interested, you know, you're more than welcome to take part in some of these sessions. And once again, it's, uh, it's just a matter of better supporting uh, you in the field to integrate. It's very often for those who start uh, using simulation to switch from a traditional classroom type of approach to really embedded simulation and, and uh, uh, reaping all its benefits. So at the end of the day, HPSN is all about people and education. And you, by now, you know that our people at C Healthcare are very engaged in, in that and very passionate about it. So we're not on the fence, we're not hesitant, we're, we're all in. Uh, and we want to advance the field of simulation-based e based education in partnership with you. So I, I thank you for coming to HPSN uh, UK. You know, being part of that dialogue for us is, is very useful and uh, very inspiring. <coughs> now I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Utam Sharalkar. I had the pleasure to meet uh, Dr. Sharalkar at the reception last night, spent a lot of time with him. I was fascinated by what he did and by you know, all his stories. So you know, I completely changed my introduction. I'm, I'm going to be minimalistic, right? I don't want to be a spoiler. I don't want to be a spoiler on something that's very intriguing to me. So just to give you a, a, a hint, right? He started as a surgeon working in the UK and then in the US, but now he's working as a psychiatrist. So it's, it's kind of a big shift, right? I'm a physician, for me it's like, you know, going from North Pole to South Pole, right? So, uh, so it, it's an interesting journey and very unique, uh, very unique career. Uh, I'll, I'll let him uh, disclose the circumstances of, of these uh, uh, decisions. Um, but now he's a surgical performance coach, which is very unique as well. So once again, very intriguing. So when he started working in psychiatry, he realized that he, un 
you understood psychological concepts and that could help the skills of a surgeon. So once again, very unique uh, angle to simulation. So he has lectured, conducted workshops and written about the significance of psychological factors in surgery to worldwide audience. A number of surgeons from a range of specialties um, have benefited from his expertise and he also wrote a book uh, has been awarded the BME, a highly recommended surgical book, so pretty impressive. And he's an advisor to the Royal College, uh, and most surgeons in the UK have undergone a course on the level of stress or stressful situations and how to cope with that. Uh, he will focus on a very interesting topic, how can we design simulations to deliver the right amount of stress to facilitate learning? But not so much because you don't want to overload the learners. So it's very intriguing and coming from a, you know, a very unique angle. So it's an important consideration, obviously, and it's totally part of our theme today of educational strategies. So uh, please help me welcoming Dr. Sharalkar. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for the kind introduction. And uh, I would like to uh, express my thanks for inviting me here, uh, HPNS, uh, especially Mandy, for considering me to share my experience and thoughts with you with this uh, important topic. Uh, to start with the title, I mean, the subtitle, some of you might find it a bit rude, uh, sort of unusual, mind your business. Uh, it is expressed, or the, the saying is for to ask somebody to limit their attention to what, what they're doing. But the purpose is not for that. It is, mind your business, it is in the context that whatever we are in, we're into simulation, either technology or training, we need to consider the mind part, the, the cognitive or the psychology part, that, that that's the purpose for using that title. And it is to kind of nudge you, it is morning, so to nudge you and to start stimulating your thought process. So it is cognitive simulation, mind your business. How, how important the psychological part is about training, about developing skill, that is the purpose. As uh, in the earlier introduction, uh, I was mentioned that I was a surgeon for 15 years and I worked in, in, in the UK and the USA. As a surgeon, I was interested in improving my performance, improving my skills. And I did everything, whatever any surgeon usually does it, uh, getting a lot of experience, operating on many patients, attending workshops. Some things did work, some things didn't. I was always thinking and analyzing myself why some things did work, why some things didn't work. Somehow, I didn't get all the answer. While I was a surgeon, uh, I had a car accident, I broke my neck, developed neurological problem, which made me unfit to continue my surgical career. So I started working in psychiatry. When I started working in psychiatry, I came across some psychology principles, and that was a kind of eureka phenomenon for me. I understood, I realized that those things that I didn't understand as a surgeon while I was trying to improve my skills, the things that did work, things that didn't work, I didn't get the reasons why things worked and how I can improve my performance better, those, all the explanations, those conundrums, the answers I got it when I started working in psychology. And there I felt that the need, I mean, I realized that if as a trainee surgeon or as a practicing surgeon, if I would have known these principles, I could have been a better surgeon. With this realization, I have been sharing this information with other surgeons and they have found it helpful. And from surgeons, because being a surgeon, I have initially focused myself on surgeons, but then Considering that development of skill is a genetic process, it is needed for everybody, especially nurse prescribers and physiotherapists, so it is spreading for other domains as well. So although my initial part of the talk is focused on surgeons, because that's how I started, the principles and the applications are generic. It can be applied to uh, any, any specialty, any field where skill development is needed, and especially for the simulation, because previously, as you know, that it used to be uh, see one, do one, teach one process, the experiential learning, and now we're moving to simulation. So when we are switching the gears, 
we need to consider what goes on into our minds, our head, our cognitive process, so that we can facilitate the training, the impact of the training. Uh, I have been conducting workshops, and I have published uh, research work, and these three books. The first one uh, got awarded by the BMS, highly recommended uh, book. This is, I'm not mentioning here is to boast myself, but it is to make you aware that how things have changed. I mean, if you consider surgeon, surgical speciality or medical speciality, there has been a big barrier between psychology, no, no. But now they have started appreciating. And the second book is about the cognitive simulation, which is the main topic for today. This one. As I mentioned, the general approach of the surgeons have not been very kind to psychology or the functional aspects. In 2002, an article was written in the British Journal of Surgery. The title was Surgeon and Cognition. And in that article, the author compared surgeons with tightrope walkers. Like you might think, oh, the, the surgeon job is so stressful that it could be considered as tightrope walking. It is very delicate, very crucial part. No, the comparison was not in that context. The comparison was tightrope walkers, when they're performing, they avoid looking at the feet for the fear of falling. The author says, that in the same manner, surgeons have avoided looking within, looking inside, looking in their mind, looking in the psychological process, how it affects the performance. And in fact, that is making them fall. So the surgeon should start looking within. And again, it applies to every professional, every performer that need to consider. Surgeons are compared to pilots for various reasons. Team working, the way their performance is crucial, and yes, there are similarities between surgeons and pilots. But there is one big difference that pilots have become aware of the human factors, how crucial the human factor or psychological processes are as far as they're functioning. That's why they've designed a system like checklist. But the aviation didn't learn it in a very easy way. They had to learn it in a very hard way. With these kind of accident, the disaster, they learned, they analyzed themselves. Uh, the Black box revealed what happened before the accident, and then they learn and they change the process, the methodology, the training. And those who, you may be aware that in the early sort of uh, part of the last century, they started to reduce, they thought about reducing the accidents by improving technology. And they made a lot of changes in the technology, but somehow they realized that the number of accidents didn't sort of fall as per they expected, and now, what they realized that it was not the technology, it was the human factors. So that's how they have started focusing on human factors. And one of the reason that the number of fatalities have reduced is because of focus of this human factor. So they have learned it hard way. And now the checklist processes have begun. And you know, the, the chances of somebody meeting with an accident are highest when you're going to the airport rather than after flying, sort of after start flying. So this much reduction, this much safety aspect has been considered in aviation. And that has sort of got a root, the basis in the way the training of aviation is conducted. The simulation technique, the simulation training has become a core part of training pilots. And because of the way aviation, the simulation has worked well in, in, in aviation, the surgeons, considering the similarities, they have started using the simulation in surgery as well. But one need to be sort of cautious about how useful the simulation is going to be in a surgery as compared to aviation. Yes, there are significant similarities, but unless and until we are aware of the small differences, small but significant differences, it may not give as good results as we wish to be. The way simulation has established in aviation, we expect that to work in surgery as well. But there are some differences between aviation and surgery. The first one is the reliance on psychomotor skill. The way surgeons need to use their hands, their psychomotor skills, is far, far more crucial for surgeons as compared to aviation. In case of aviation, the most sort of the cognitive, the part is that they take the information, analyze the information, make the decision, and implement it. Okay? 
and that is one difference. The second difference is, imagine how many types of aeroplanes are there. If I uh, correct, there are about 70 to 80 types of designs, okay? Compare that with the infinite variation of the patients that we get. So that is the another difference. And third one is the disaster, the complications that happen in aviation mostly because of the decision making and team working. Again, which may not be the case in surgery. The surgery, significant part, not all, significant part of the complication occur because of the technical skill. So there are certain differences, although there are similarities. So there are similarities between aviation and surgery, but there are certain differences as well. So we need to be mindful of the differences. And if, now being a sort of global and interactive specialities, if we are learning from other specialities, and if there are differences between aviation and surgery, is there any faculty, is there any specialty which could be nearer or akin to the surgery? Yes, that's athletics. The sports, the sports people, their functioning, their working is far more similar to surgery than aviation and especially in case of psychomotor skills. The kind of movements athletes, athletes perform are not the usual movements. In a similar manner, surgeons or any skilled performance, the way we use our fingers, our hands, are unique. So in that way, any performers, healthcare performers, can be equated with athletes. Second thing, the performance, the duration, and sometimes it is such a crucial stage of a performance, they have to give 100% in the focus, the stress. Competition, I know that in sports, the competition is against the opponent. In case of healthcare, skill performer, the competition is against the disease, the illness. And we want to win over the disease process, the pathology, and it is a crucial time. At the same time, uncertainty. The kind of uncertainty that athletes, the sportsmen face, is again similar to what the surgeons or the any uh, healthcare performer faces. So there are far more similarities between athletes and skill performer and surgeon than with aviation. If it is so, it could be applicable that whatever the athletes or the performer are doing to improve their performance, same thing could be applicable for surgeons or any skill performers. And yes, and this is where this cognitive simulation of the mental practice, mental training comes into play. The mental training has, now the way simulation has taken roots in, in, in technology, in aviation, in the same manner mental practice has been established in athletics. I don't know how many of you uh, did watch uh, London Olympics especially, and there was a big discussion. And for every session, there was a discussion about mental training, how far mind is playing, how this elite professional has gone to this level with so many difficulties. And now, it is not just with elite, it is for the beginners as well. So it is used in at both spectrum, for the beginners as well as elite. And one need to be mindful that professional athletes who are performing at that level, they need some coaching, psychological training. So you can imagine how influential, how effective it be. I mean, they must be in that their business for 10, 20 years at an international level, but still they do realize the need for psychological input. And this, there is a lot of literature. So if it is useful, now this slide shows when aviation engineers were busy in designing and developing technical solutions for improving the performance for pilots, the sports psychologists were busy in designing mental techniques to improving athletes' performance. And I've just given some, some sample studies. There are a lot of studies uh, of this kind that when they, have, when they have compared the actual physical performance as compared to mental practice. And as you can see, the results are more or less same. Now, the next one would be more interesting, especially in today's context. It is not just either physical performance or mental performance, it's the combination. And that has been shown that when the athletes perform just with physical training, and when the athletes use physical as well as mental training, the performance were better. And there are some studies, uh, as you may be aware, that simulators are used in athletics as well. There are certain papers which shows that 
combination of simulation training and mental practice does give far better results than either of them alone. So it is not an alternative. It is not either this or that. It is an adjunct. It is a facilitator in addition to conventional either hands-on training or simulation training. I'm just going to mention one paper from surgery because this is the first randomized control trial they performed in Germany as far as the mental training, comparative uh, analysis of uh, practice on simulator and mental training. So there were three groups of surgeons. One was asked to perform on the laparoscopic cholecystectomy simulator and the other one was the control and third one was asked, they, they were taught about mental techniques and the green one, the, the blue one is mental group, mental training group. This one is simulator group and this one was control. So both group improved, improved in a more or less similar fashion. But more interesting is the second observation. What they did, they chose specific tasks and they evaluated on the specific tasks. And interestingly, the mental group performed better than the actual physical or simulator task. You may be surprised, but there is a reason. And I think you can appreciate when you are in the middle of activity, your focus is on a particular area because it's a tunnel vision, okay? And you may not be able to absorb, gather all the information that is needed for you to improve the performance. And when sometimes you step back a little bit, you get a, get a better perspective and that improves performance. And that is the reason why sometimes, and you may have experienced or observed that sometimes when you're stressed, when you're in the middle of some hectic activity and when you're unable to find out the solution, you're told you just step back a little bit, things will come to you. So this is one of the explanation that having too much of information, you become tunnel vision and you lose the perspective. And then when you step back, things are better perceived and that's why you perform better. So this is one of the principle. So we heard so far about all the factors about how uh, skill performance is developed and how mental training is useful, but where does this cognitive simulation comes from? And this is the standard definition. It is a creation or recreation of a procedure through multisensory modalities that resemble the experience of actually performing the procedure. So in short, it is designing your own personal simulator or pers creating your own virtual reality in your own mind. The most important word is this, multisensory. And there's a reason why I or we recommend this term cognitive simulation. It is not just for the sake of being trendy. There is a reason for that. The reason being, I mean, you might be thinking, oh, isn't that I do whenever I'm going to learn a complex new procedure? I revise those things in my mind. I, I've been told that just use your sort of imagination uh, in the mind side, you visualize the process and do it. So what's, what's the big deal about this term cognitive simulation? The reason is this term, multisensory. Unless it is multisensory, it is not cognitive simulation and it won't give the impression, the effect that as you get by just visualizing. And this is the reason why I recommend strongly using cognitive simulation. I mean, we use this term, seeing in the mind side, visualization, that means that you are limiting your process just to visual modality. It is not cognitive simulation. It won't give as good results at, as you would get otherwise. Then there is a term, and it is in scientific literature, they have used the term mental practice. Why not mental practice? Because the term mental practice means anything to anybody. It might mean just visualizing the process, the steps, or just verbalizing the steps, that saying one, two, three, I will do this, I will do that. It doesn't have a clarity, and that's where the difference is. Cognitive simulation is a specific process, specific method of mental practice. You can say that, but it is different. Again, the word cognitive simulation, my insistence is, to give an example, if you want to Google something, you will get the information whatever you type. The brain works in a similar manner. If you say mental practice, again, you will get various reasons. You can try that. If you, if you type mental practice in Google, you will get various different kind of uh, literature, which is not necessarily cognitive simulation. But if you type cognitive simulation, you will get a specific literature. By the way, I didn't coin the term. It has been used in the literature, but it has not been popular. But I've seen the benefits, the effect of using the specific word. And that's why I would strongly recommend, that's why I always 
put that title first. It's a cognitive simulation. It is the simulation or the simulator you create in your own mind, which is available 24 hours free of cost. And you can use it for whichever procedure you want. That's why I would like to stick to this term. It, it seems to be a new term, but is it something new that we didn't know? No, it has been there. We have been using it all along for any learning, any performance, we use it. The only, th in fact, 90% of population is able to do that. The difference is the variability. I mean, we all don't have the similar kind of capacity of cognitive simulation. To the extent, even congenitally blind people can perform that. The only thing is that they use different sensory modalities than the conventional one. But because we are not aware how powerful this technique is, we don't employ it in very sort of often, there isn't any structured explicit method of teaching, learning, evaluating it. So we are not using it in an optimum manner. And we are losing our, our strengths, our, our faculties. And that is the result. We have to spend more time, more energy on repetition of the task. But if you understand the principles, if you understand the benefits, the advantage, and the, the techniques which are not too difficult to, to absorb, to understand, things would be a lot simpler for acquisition of skill. And more of a transferability of the skill from a simulation suite or from the, the, the learning unit to the actual performance. That's the thing. And because of that, because we have not been aware our performance has been suboptimal. Now, we're into this business where we want to train people to develop skills. And the dictum is, practice makes perfect. Is it so? Is it really? I want to challenge that. Does practice make perfect? For us to understand, let's see how skill is developed. There are specific, and this is applicable for any skill, right? From typing, driving, cooking, anything, whatever you do, it goes through three specific steps. The first one is cognitive step. What does it mean? It is a conscious, it is a deliberate, we have to focus. Let's say you want to learn Benny Punction. Okay, you haven't done it before, you have only seen it, and you want to learn it, okay? So what you do, you first get the information, you see somebody doing it, you are told that you are going to perform the Benny Puncture. So you get the information, you know how to do it, and then you prepare yourself with all the information that you are going to do it, and then you start doing it. You, just, you do it for the once, the first time, it goes well, okay, and then you are you're told, you are trained that this is how you do it, this is, this is the way you hold the needle and all. So you try it three, four, five times, and after six times it becomes Automatic, you don't have to pay any attention, yeah? So the first one is cognitive, which is conscious. You have to have deliberate focus. You can't focus on other things. So that is the first one. Then associative, as you start doing it two, three, four times, you don't have to focus as much as you used to, and the focus is on a different aspect. You don't have to focus on how to hold the needle. And after, say, eight times again, which depends upon individual to individual, at eight or tenth time, it becomes individual. It, it becomes automatic. Hey. So you consider to be a competent, you consider yourself to be skilled, okay? But there's a difference. The skill becomes automatic, not necessarily perfect. Okay? There are advantage for skill to become automatic because so that you can focus your attention on something else. But just skill becomes automatic doesn't mean that it is a 100% skill. There's an advantage of skill becoming automatic, but there is a problem as well. And the most important problem is that once skill becomes automatic, it stays as it is. Now, if you try a knot in, say, seven seconds, that you consider that you trying a knot in seven seconds becomes automatic. If you try the knot thousand times, it will stay seven seconds. It is not going to improve by a few seconds more just because you have tried it seven times. It, it becomes mechanical. Just like mechanical, it stays constant. If at all, it gets worse over the time. Okay? Now, if you want to improve the skill, from automatic, you need to go back to the cognitive part. So for example, you learned driving on a manual car. And then after a few years, you bought automatic car. So for 10 years, you have been driving automatic car. So you forget the skill about changing the gears. Now suppose if you decide to go back to a gear car, 
for a few minutes, you need to retrain yourself about how to change the clutch and all. So that's, that is the stage where you're putting in cognitive part again. Although the skill, the driving, it, it was automatic for you. When you left, when you changed from gear car to aut automatic car, it was already set in. You didn't have to put con conscious efforts about how to drive a car. But because you have been driving automatic for 10 years, you forgot the skill. But to retrain yourself, you need to put in the cognitive. And that's why the, the cognitive part comes into play. Like, for example, if you are tying the knot for, let's say, eight seconds, yes, you can tie a knot in four seconds, but you have to deliberately try to reduce the speed by doing something by movement faster, keeping conscious about being time on, about the time. So if you want to improve a skill, you need to put in cognitive input into that, which has happened in the initial stage. And at the same time, one needs to understand that whatever stage automatic, and if you have got some errors, it will stay as it is. So if you want to remove any problematic part of the skill, again, you need to put into cognitive input. So that's where practice doesn't make it perfect. If at all, a perfect practice make it perfect. And this, this cognitive simulation will help you to make a perfect practice. Now, what are the cognitive factors we're talking about? The first one is psychological. There are three specific cognitive factors that are important in uh, this performance. As you know, I mean, you need to have a motivation. You need to be able to attain the, the whatever task at hand. You need to keep the sort of concentration. Dealing with the stress in, perform, in, in case of very difficult, stressful situation, or if you're learning a very complex procedure, it does make you stress. So dealing with the stress, these are all psychological factors that one need to take into consideration, and perceptual factors. All the information in this world, whatever you are learning, you get it through sensory apparatus. We'll go into detail later on. In fact, that is the main focus of this cognitive simulation. So there is a perceptual, perceptual system where you gather the information around you. And then the non-perceptual factors, the knowledge, the decision making at the time of performing the procedure, so all these three factors, so it is not just psychological, it is not just knowledge that makes you a better performer, a skilled performer, it is all three, three factors combined that makes you a better performer. Now, among all these three, perceptual factor is the most neglected, it is the least obvious and it is the most important as far as skill development is concerned. It is a bit complex, but I will explain to you how these perceptual factors affect your skill performance. And there are four specific stages. Let's take, for example, you want to learn tying a knot. Okay? The initial condition is there are four stages that you have got a sort of thread uh, in your hand, and you know that there is a bleeder, and you're supposed to tie a knot around it. So you understand your position of the fingers and hand and where you're standing. So this information, you get it from the sensory apparatus, and then there is a response specification, you ask your brain, this is how you want to perform the fingers and hands. And then it gives you direction, speed, and force, okay? Then you understand the sensory consequences. Whatever you have done, you get a feedback. This is okay, now this tie is tight enough, I can release the clamp, and then you get the response outcome. Whatever you have done, and then you go to the next stage, okay? So this all, it is the interaction between what you do and what you see and whatever your actions are, how they impact upon you. So this is a kind of cycle that goes on. This is how you improve your skill. So for learning, for performing and improving your skill, this cycle needs to go on. And how do we get all the information about whether, how to do it, where to do it? It's through perceptual apparatus. So the faster this cycle goes, the better or the quicker is your performance or improvement or shorter is your learning curve. The better the quality of performance, better the quality of your outcome. So, and that has been seen. What is the difference between a novice and an expert? They have got better skill about what to see, what, how to sort of perform that movement or what, the, what is the relevance of this particular moment. So they have got a better understanding of the situation. They have got a better processing apparatus installed in their brain. And that's why they are able to pick up. I mean, a surgeon who has done 
thousands of particular procedure who just touch the skin and who would realize, okay, this patient had undergone this kind of operation about before two to three times. The skin is going to be thick. I need to use a very sort of stronger force and I need to use a particular number of uh, kind of scalpel. Or for other, like if you're using laparoscopy, they need to use different kind of technique depending upon the thickness of the uh, hardness of the skin. And this is the perceptual difference. When I was a trainee, my uh, one of the best surgeon I have worked with, he used to tell me that, just don't look. He used to take my sort of hand and feel it, feel it. He used to me deliberately teach, used to teach me deliberately the tactile sense. So he needs to, he wanted to enrich us with the different sensory field, sensory uh, modalities. And this is why it is important that you need to enrich yourself with different sensory or perceptual sensation. And that's why it is important. So what specific sensory modalities you need to be concerned about when you are training a skill? There are five specific sensory modalities that you need to consider about. First one is obvious, visual. You need to have all the visual information. Then you need to have kinesthetic, where the movement sensation, which is again, that's why this uh, simulators are useful that they create sensory, the proprioceptive pro sense where all your joints and muscles give you the information about. And then there is tactile and auditory. And I, I, I feel that one may not appreciate the importance of uh, auditory information, but at the end of uh, the last part, I'm going to sort of show you how important it is and then olfactory. It may not be important for every procedure, but for surgeons especially, uh, the olfactory sense, I mean, when I do this workshop, among if there are 10, 15 surgeons, one or two voluntarily come up with, oh, this, uh, I can smell the olfactory sensation. And the importance of it is that olfactory nerve is the shortest cranial nerve in the body, and it has got a strong emotional impact. And this is my anecdotal experience, as those surgeons who come up with this olfactory sensation, they're usually better among the rest of the lot. So it may be something to do with your awareness or your skill, uh, although it is in day-to-day -day practice, it, is, it may not be that important, but this, the four sensory modalities are very important. I'm going to give you a glimpse of what I do in the training and to give an idea what this cognitive simulation is and how it can be taught. So we're going to go through these four uh, sensory modalities and then I'm going to give a kind of overall uh, impression. So let's talk about visual modality. You won't be in healthcare field if you won't, if you're not expert or very comfortable in using visual modality, visual thinking. We all have different kind of styles, but visual thinking or visual modality is the dominant part of most of us, especially in healthcare. So let me tell you, let's have some exercises about how we can improve our visual modality. I'm going to ask you to answer this question. Okay, those who can't see. In which hand the Statue of Liberty holds the torch? And which of Mona Lisa's hand is crossed over the other? Okay? Right. Okay. Right. I don't know how many of you got it. But I didn't want to test your general knowledge. This question was not asked, not asked to test your general knowledge. It is to tell you how we use visual modality, visual information. <laughs> we have got reservoir of information, and whenever needed, we take it out, and then we use it. So it was just for this presentation purpose general question, but it is to do with anatomy of the sort of procedure that you are doing it. Now, obviously, better the retrieval, better is the outcome. Yeah? Now, it is difficult to retrieve all the relevant information. Now, you might be satisfying yourself, oh, I didn't bother to look at the picture, and I saw the statue a long time back, so I don't remember. How do you expect me to remember such a trivial things? Okay, fine, that's fair to say. Now, I'm going to ask you to imagine a face of a person with whom you are very close to, either maybe your spouse, your parent, your uh, daughter, and your ch of son, anybody, anybody whom you are very close to, I would suggest you to visualize his or her face in front of you. As good as, as if that person is in front of you. Try to 
imagine it, create an illusion for yourself that that person, that face is in front of you. Yeah, I'll give you three seconds for you to try. Okay, now, if this is the best quality of picture that you could imagine, let's give 10, and this is the worst, zero. Okay, in my experience, if I ask each of you to rate yourself from zero to 10, most of you would be between five, six, yeah? Very few, it is like, you know, normal distribution curve, very few would be 10, and some of you may not be able to visualize it appropriately at all, okay? So, now, earlier, for the earlier question, you may not be familiar, you may not have bothered to look at it, but this is a person that you have been very, very familiar with. But when you're asked to imagine the quality of resolution, I mean, would you agree with that? I mean, some of you, yeah? I mean, I can see the nods, yes. Why, I mean, in spite of being familiar, why aren't you able to sort of visualize it as clearly as you would like to. Again, extrapolate that to the, your clinical sort of experience. When you have seen a procedure, say, about 10 times, and when you're asked to teach somebody, you know, you miss the details because you yourself are not able to visualize it in detail. What can be done to address this problem? I will give a different example. I think some of you may remember, may have heard or may have seen, there used to be black and white TV, yeah? After that, it became color TV, then it became HD, and now there are 3D TVs. I have a question for you. The last innovation is some way significantly different than the previous three. That is, there are obviously various aspects, but there is one specific in the context of today's discussion. What is it that makes this last innovation or technological sort of advances different than previous three? It is one thing. You may be thinking answers, but let me give you the answer myself. It is that for this one, to enjoy the benefits of technology, you need to wear glasses. Yeah? Unless and until you wear the glasses, you won't be able to enjoy the technological innovation. And that is the difference between previous three. These three were passive. You didn't have to do anything. Yeah? Automatically, I mean, it became colored, then it became better resolution, it became HD. You used to enjoy it, but if you want to enjoy 3D, unless and until you wear glasses, unless and until you make some change in yourself, you won't be able to enjoy the benefits of the technology. And that's why for the resolution to improve, you need to start looking at the things in a different manner. Then only you would get the benefit of cognitive simulation, and that is the deliberate attempt. And let me tell you, I mean, it may be, you might think, oh, it's so difficult, how do I have to do for the rest of my professional career? It just become automatic. Like any skill, this cognitive simulation is a skill. After a certain stage, it just reminds, that's what the difference is. The experts are able to see better because they have developed or they have uploaded the soft load, software which makes them think a little bit in detail, a little bit clearer than others. And once you do that, once you download that software deliberately, your sort of visual skill of obtaining visual information would get better. Okay? So that was about the resolution, about the quality of visual information. Now, the quality, the resolution is just one part. The next part is visual dimension. Now, you have hired a van, you have got a guest and you have hired a van, which you are not used to be driving that van before, and this is the only parking lot available for you to park. Yeah? How would you take the decision? I mean, obviously, you're not going to get take a measuring tape and see whether it will fit into that lot or not. You're going to take a judgment, visual judgment, that, okay, this is the available space, this is the width of my van, and then you take a call whether to park it or not. Okay? In a similar way, when you are performing, there are various things that decide the dimension. And then you make a decision whether this size will, this size of processes will fit in or how big the incision would be or where, where should I take the incision. So there are a lot many metrics that are taken into consideration when you are performing the process. In a routine sort of uh, procedure, we don't bother, but this is what the experts 
differ from others. And this is what I train. I, I, what I do in my training session, I ask them to choose a procedure that they want to improve upon. And then I give them, again, in their mind screen, I ask them to compare. OK, do the sort of playing the video in your own mind and focus on these aspects at all. So dimensions about specificities. What is the size of the particular organ? What is the depth of this particular organ? And by simulation technology, we built it in. But that's the difference between the passive learning and active learning. When the active learning is involved, it stays longer and the impact is better. So it is about asking them to involve in a virtual reality in an active manner rather than passive manner. And then there comes mental chronometry. If I make, take a walk from this wall to that wall, and if I show you that this is the pace, and if I ask you to play in your own mind and to tell me how much time it took for me, you'd be playing that videotape in your mind. And if your imagination, if your visualization is optimum, you would be able to predict correctly how much time it took. And that is called as mental chronometer. And it has been scientifically proven that the time for you to imagine a particular action in your mind is if your imagination is correct, if you are doing it in a very reasonable manner, it should match the actual time that takes for particular action. And this is one of the only objective tests that can be performed for anybody to find out whether your imagination is correct. I'll give you one day-to-day -day example in life. I mean, uh, those who follow cricket, this fielder has taken a catch by jump with one hand by jumping. Now imagine he must have to calculate the speed of the ball. He must have to calculate the distance of that ball from, where the, from the bat to the ball. He has to jump at the right time. He has to take the action. If he jumped too quick, then it won't, I mean, he will fall on the ground sooner. If he jumped too late, the ball must have passed. So this is how important. And it, it happens in our performance as well, day-to-day -day life. When you're operating, there is a certain gush of bleeder, one has to jump. Okay? It may not be as crucial as instant every time, but it is always there in, in your mind. The, the, the very usual and common example I give is those who have worked in the theater. If you ask a surgeon how much time he or she is going to take to complete the case, you know the response, yeah? Always, being a surgeon, they, they kind of fast forward it, and always, and if you ask the anesthetist, he gives a different timing, yeah? And the theater nurse knows what to make of these. I mean, they usually calculate. If you ask the surgeon how much time, oh, half an hour, then, and the surgeon says one and a half hour, then the nurse says that it is going to take one hour, so she decides what time to send for the patient. Yeah? This is the difference. If the surgeon would have played, and there may be a few surgeons who maybe their, their videotape may be running in a, in, a, in a sort of reasonable manner. The reason for I'm explaining this is that when I do this kind of course, and you may be thinking, OK, I'm going to use this cognitive simulation for a particular procedure. Now, if that pro procedure is going to last for one hour, two hours, are you expected to do that videotape for two hours? No, it's, it's impractical. Okay? But there, I mean, when you perform any procedure, it is most of the time repetition of the same act. You don't have to. But there are certain steps where you have to play it in real time. Only then it will get translated into the actual performance. And this is the reason why some performers, although they know the, perform the procedure very well, they, cons they are considered to be too slow or sometimes too jittery. I mean, either way, the speed, either it is too fast, they, they know what to do, they don't know, so they don't know what to do in an appropriate manner, or they're too slow. So this is the reason why they need to, when they're practicing, they need to, what I suggest them, make a video of their procedure, and it is easier for the simulation, and then they, they need to play it in their own mind, and they need to compare themselves about whether their, their thinking is in a right speed. Observational learning is a integral part of any skill learning nowadays. Be it hands-on, be it on the simulator, you observe something being done, and then you start learning. But there are variations. You might have seen that you train, say, 10 uh, individuals, and there is a variability. Some people do pick up quickly. Some take a longer time. Why is it so? The cognitive science has done a research on this. One thing is that 
you, if you observe for the sake of observation, the implementation is less. But you observe with the intention of performing yourself, it has a better impact. To give, give, give a further sort of scientific information, there are certain types of neurons in the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is a, is a part of the brain which deals with the motor actions. And up until recently, it was thought that in frontal lobe, there are only motor neurons, neurons which gives order to, to act on. But now they have found out that there are certain kind of neurons which, which, sorry, which are called as mirror neurons. Now, although these neurons are in frontal lobe, which is supposed to be motor cortex, they get stimulated even when you're observing the action, not just when you're, act, when you're acting. And what is seen is that your capacity to gain the benefits of observational learning are highest when these mirror neurons are stimulated. So those people who are able to stimulate themselves better with mirror neurons are able to observe and act very well. Further to that, what has been seen that you don't need to observe somebody else's actions. If you observe your own action, it still improves your performance. And this is again the difference between experts and not so experts. It is seen that the experts in, in athletics and other, they all, they're thinking about the actions all the time in their mind. This is what they're thinking. And because, although they may be performing certain procedures at 10 times, they have played that simulation in their mind thousand times and that's why their learning curve is shorter. But that thinking, that cognitive simulation needs to be in a particular manner and that's why it is very important. Just by visualizing won't give you as results. I mean, it is the next part, the kinesthetic part that is more important. So if you are able to cognitively simulate particular actions, suppose you have trained somebody on a simulator and if you test them after say, 10 days, someone who has practiced in the mind in an appropriate manner is definitely going to perform a lot better than the one who had just seen, okay, that's fine, good, it's a great, it's a grand simulator, fantastic teacher. But no, I mean, it didn't get translated into the improvement of the performance of that trainee or the learner. So that was about the one modality, visual modality. Next comes tactile modality, okay, the touch. Now I know that uh, and this is one of the advances that simulators have made that introducing haptic touch because initially I don't think that in aviation I don't think that they need that much haptic touch but for surgeons that is the first thing that they introduce in, in, in the kind of uh, healthcare that haptic touch is very very important. Why? Why this, th there is another reason, another theory why this cognitive simulation works. It is called as dual coding theory. Whenever there is information which is stored in a sensory modality specific, I'll give an example. Suppose you're asked to perform something, or some, I mean, somebody's performing a skill, and you're around, and that particular uh, professional is unable to do the procedure in the right manner, and he, and he or she asks you, okay, can you tell me how to do it? You stand beside him, and you try to figure out what advice could be given, but you're unable to find out what the solution is. Okay, then you decide, okay, let me try myself. And once you try doing it yourself, all the things come to your mind, you are able to find the solution. Do you know why this happens? It happens because information is sensory specific. You store the information in particular modalities. Once you start doing it, then you come to know how to do it. When you, even though you may not have ridden a bicycle for a long time, once you sit on a sort of saddle, you, you figure out how, to, how you used to ride a bicycle. In the same way, there are all these procedural skills are sensory modality specific. So once you store information in various modalities, and that's why dual coding, uh, if an information is stored in more than one modality, it is easier to retrieve, and this is one of the reasons why it works. It is like, you know, when, if you go to a financial advisor, the dictum is that you shouldn't be focusing, uh, you're not going to put all the sort of eggs in one basket, you need to spread your investment. Why? Because in case of crisis, you don't know which kind of investment gives you return. In the same way, our brain is smarter. That the brain stores information in different modalities, so when you're focused, when you're talking to somebody, the 
sensory, the tactile sense give you information and that's why it is dual coding. The another example to make it simpler what this dual coding is, let's say example if you want to store the, w the sort of house as a term, okay? You can store that as H-O-U-S-E in word format or you can pictureize, you can visualize a house, your own house and you can store it in a visual format. So whenever you need it, anything can come out. I mean, you must have some experience that you, you, you start talking with your friend about a friend whom you haven't met for a long time, and you're unable to figure out his or her name. But you can figure out the face, and vice versa. Yeah? It is the same thing, that you don't know which modality would be helpful, which modality may have strength and may have stored that information. So you need to have a diversity as far as this information is concerned. And that storing that information needs to be deliberate. You won't know. And if you use all that, it becomes easier. So this is the reason why one need to focus on tactile information. And there is another biological reason. Uh, when the scans were done, whenever there has been a tactile simulation, it has been seen that the visual cortex and the frontal cortex get stimulated as well. So neurologically, this information is shared. Whenever you use tactile sensation, it goes signal. And that's why things come to you when you touch, when you start doing some, something. Even surgeons have told me that as soon as they start scrubbing, as soon as they wear the gloves, they get different idea about the procedure. It, because that's the connection. Because whatever information they have stored in their brain gets stimulated. As soon as they, they wear glove, it gets stimulated. So that's why it is important to keep an idea. Uh, there are certain uh, specific nonsense about active and passive touch, but I don't want to uh, dwell on that. And this is the third most important modality. I mean. I, during the session, I tell, I'll tell but the participants that if there is any single take home message about this cognitive simulation, it is about the kinesthetic modality. Now, many people, when I, I started this training, I used to get a feedback after a few months. People used to say, yes, I mean, what you told us, it's right, I'm, I'm using it, but you know, it's not as effective as you told or I thought it to be. And when I used to sort of dig deeper, it used to become apparent that they're not using the kinesthetic modality. They're still in using in visual modality. And that's the problem. There are two types of memories that we have. One is declarative memory, and other is procedural memory. Declarative memory is that we know what to do. And we have all this visual information. We know the anatomy. We remember how it is done. But the procedural memory is that how actually you do it. So just by having visual information, you feel confident that, yes, I know how to do it. But actually, when you start doing it, you're unable to perform. And that's the reason why there is a difference between observing and doing it. So you need to start involving that kinesthetic, that muscular sense. And this is how it works. Again, it is evidence-based that when you imagine in a kinesthetic manner, it creates some changes in the muscle, it, what it calls a muscle memory. Although the amplitude is small, if you do it 1,000 times, it is as good as you doing the action, the actual action. And this is the experiment we did. Uh, this is the EMG recording. It was the abduction of the thumb. So this is the actual action, yeah? See the amplitude? This is static, it's a flat. And this is, I don't know how many of you can see, but there are small amplitudes. Yeah, so if you think, if you imagine in a muscular sense, it does create changes in the amplitude. And if the summation potential, if you do it 1,000 times, it becomes better. And it's not just EMG. There are other studies that have shown. So it is not just psychological mumbo jumbo. There is a strong evidence base that if you perform this cognitive simulation in ideal manner, the cortical changes are seen as, as if you are experiencing the, uh, the sense that this is for people who were asked to visual imagine, visually imagine, and they tested the blood flow in the occipital cortex. It is more or less same. Same thing, people were asked to uh, imagine listening to music, and they were actually exposed to music. The temporal cortex changes were more or less same. So that is, again, 
strong evidence that if you do follow the principles of the cognitive simulation, yes, you need to practice it, you need to deliberately try it for the time, for the, in the beginning, but once you are sort of, you tried it enough times, it becomes automatic. And the last one is auditory. When I ask people to imagine the, or remember what are the auditory signals, they say various things that, okay, when I was learning, I was asked to do this way, that way, that's what I remember. I remember the anesthetist talking and all those things. But the most important thing which we are interested in, the self-talk. Whenever you are performing anything, you talk to yourself. Although like dream, you may not be aware of it, but you talk to ourselves. Not only we talk to ourselves, what we talk to ourselves have got a big impact on how we perform. Now, let me give you a kind of example in athletics. Now, if you see two athletes, one who is talking himself or herself in a very assertive, positive manner, it is known that it has got an impact on his or her performance. And now, again, I don't know whether you have seen, but there are many sort of athletes who have explained this, that this is what they do, this is what they talk to themselves before performance. And again, this is not just for athletes, it is in everyday field as well. So let me explain to you in a different manner. Now, suppose you are performing a procedure and you are a bit apprehensive about performing it, you haven't done that procedure before, but you did it very well. Surprisingly, you, you, you did very well and imagine how would you feel about yourself? You feel great, I mean, you feel content, yeah? And the thoughts would be that you can do it again, you can do it better next time. So when you do it bet next time, you'll obviously do it better, okay? So this is the circle and it is the foundation principle of the cognitive behavioral therapy. Whatever we do, it has got an impact on what we feel and what we think. But as you can see, the arrows are not unidirectional. It works in both directions. So what you think about yourself, about the procedure, has got impact on what you do and what you feel. And that's where the confidence. You may have seen some of the trainees, some of the health professionals, they seem to be reasonably skilled, but they lack in confidence. It is because of that. It is not that they lack their skills, they lack the thought process. It is as if we have got a video clip going on and we have got an audio clip going on in our head and people do say that hearing voices. That there is an audio tape and there is, if there isn't any synchrony between this video and audio, it affects the performance. They need to be synchrony and it need to be positive synchrony. So when you have got a, what I have seen is that when a trainee, I, and I kind of, try to take a feedback, I want to assess, and I do give kind of individual uh, coaching as well. What I have seen is that just a trainee or a healthcare pro professional using the word try, like for example, there are two professionals, one is saying that, okay, I'm going to do this procedure, and the other one says, I'm going to try doing this procedure, the word try makes a difference as well. That makes somebody sensitive or sensitive, and they become hesitant. So one news you use that, if this is the thought process one has, I'm not good enough. Imagine what could be about, what could be happening upon his or her performance. If one has got this thought process, it does affect the performance as well. And especially what happens, you have seen two performers dealing with a stressful situation in a different way. Why? It is not just an experience, it is the thought process. When somebody is not able to handle the situation in a manner that one is expected to, this is what they think, oh my God, it is not, it is a disaster, I'm not going to handle it. Imagine what is going to be happening. On the contrary, if the thought process is, it's a challenge, I'm going to handle it, one is able to deal different. So one need to be aware what happens inside the head, what kind of inner voice is telling to that performer. You might be thinking all these soft skills, are they relevant when simulation and technology is getting so advanced, so developed? Why do we need all these cognitive factors? The answer is not only we need it, we need it more than before. This is the way I would explain it. Remember how did we learn riding a bicycle? Okay, just take a bike or somebody, a uh, family member taught us in a few hours and hey, we go. Think about learning to drive a car. We had few sessions, but we had to undergo testing and all and then we were able to be considered competent. 
Imagine thinking about learning to fly a plane. It's more stringent. We need to have a right test and all. So the more complex system is, the more important these basic fundamental factors become. And you would imagine that until recently or even now, in some cases, the medical field has become as complex as flying a plane. But still, we are learning a procedure like riding a bicycle. That need to change. That's what we need to focus upon those factors. And the last point I want to mention that you might have seen this uh, on various railway platforms, mind the gap. So they want to make us aware that there is a gap between the platform and the train. And before boarding, you need to be mindful of the gap so that you won't hurt yourself or others. In the same way, when we want to train skills to others, we need to be mindful of the gap, that there are certain participants, certain trainees, who will be able to pick up the skill very well and who they won't be. We need to be not only mindful of the gap, but we need to be mindful that the mind itself causes the gap. And unless and until we give, we acknowledge that the mind, the cognitive factors, the psychology plays the role in creating this gap, we won't be able to close the gap and the gap will remain and the patient, in some cases, patient safety may get affected. The way the human factor has come along in healthcare, I think that these intra-human factors need to be considered as well. Yes, there are objectives, there are, these are obvious things about team working, but in case of certain skills, it is ultimately the performer, the individual, who has to take the responsibility, who has to make the changes. So what I feel is that having sort of a better focus, better understanding of this cognitive factors, we can create a cognitive simulation, which again would be very helpful in combining the aim, the application of simulator, and your own performance. So I would like to again thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I hope it would be useful for your course. Thank you. Um, um, thank you, Utam. When I met Utam last year, um, our very short coffee break became an afternoon of talking about this. And so, me, I found that really inspiring. Utam will be around for a, um, a little bit longer today, so please try and catch him over coffee. But just before um, coffee, just a couple of announcements. Um, the Trent Simulation team have been YouTubing all of this, as you know. And so, Utam has gone out across the world. And I have a colleague, Dr. Lulu Sharif, in Mangalore, India. Her whole simulation team watched most of the keynotes yesterday live. So, thank you, guys. Um, today, um, the sessions will begin shortly. Um, the Brayburn Room, um, some of the uh, folks there forgot to bring a laptop. There is now one in there for you, so please don't panic, because everybody seemed to be in that room. Again, the color of the top, we just all have different colors because people are still asking me about that for the CA healthcare team. And please don't forget the e-poster walk beginning at one o'clock. There's two or three people that still haven't given me their e-posters. So if you can come and find me shortly, then I can take that off you. And finally, my good friend and colleague, Mr. Ronnie Shura, would like to just to come and just say literally a couple of things before you go for coffee, Ronnie. Thank you very much. Um, I don't want to hold you off too long for coffee. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm um, the sales manager for Europe, Middle East and Africa in behalf of CAE Healthcare. And um, as you learned yesterday how committed we are to our UK colleagues and friends, uh, we are going to add another position to the whole organization we have already, right? And we're doing this practically today and um, I would like to welcome Milos to stage. So help me to introduce, uh, or help me to welcome Milos. Um, Milos practically met his colleague two hours ago, right? But, so very fresh, um, from university, he graduated yesterday um, from the um, Oxford Brookes University with a, very good, hold on, with a, with a very high ranking, so just a couple of percentages away from the, from the top rankings, right? So we are very gladful to, to have you now as a, as, a, as a team member, right? Great to have you here. Milos will fulfill the role of an account manager, right? So whenever he's giving you a call, 
you have a phase to a name now, right? So he's the guy staying in contact with you and learn more about your needs and how we could serve you best, right? So I thought it, it's a good opportunity to get Milos in front of you. You know him now. And with that, good to have you on board. Thank you very much. Congratulations again for that great work. And um, have a good day. <laughs> Thank you, Milos.